Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome, everybody. Just a little housekeeping first. So I'm going to moderate the conversation between Peter and Sai. They're going to talk for <clears throat> about 40 minutes. And as they chat, feel free to type questions into the chat box, which you should be able to find to the right of your screen. And when Peter and Sai have finished talking, I will have about 10 minutes for Q&As at the end. So let's get started. I am Jane Billinghurst. I'm super happy to be here with two of my favorite authors, Peter Wollleben and Cy Montgomery. And I've been tra translating many of Peter's books into English since we started working together with The Hidden Life of Trees back in 2015. And the book we're talking about today, The Heartbeat of Trees, is our latest collaboration. I first came across Cy Montgomery's writing when I read The Good Good Pig, her fascinating account of raising a pig called Christopher Hogwood as he grew from a runt piglet to an impressive 750 pounds. Then I had the great pleasure of meeting Cy in person a few years ago when she came to the Pacific Northwest on a promotional tour for the soul of an octopus. And I've just finished reading her latest book, a little gem called The Hummingbird's Gift, which is about two orphan hummingbirds being rescued and raised so they can be released back into the wild. And both Peter and Cy have written numerous books for children as well. So I should give you a brief bio for, for the two of them. Uh, Sai is a naturalist, documentary script writer and author, and she's traveled the world from jungles in Borneo to caves in Costa Rica to the underwater world in the Caribbean, getting up close and personal with the wonderful animals that she writes about. And she's the uh, recipient of numerous honors, including Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Humane Society and the New England Booksellers Association. And she lives in New Hampshire. So Peter lives and works in Germany, where he studied forestry. He spent over 20 years as a state forester before leaving to put his ideas of ecologically friendly forestry into practice in a community forest. He's founded a forest academy to spread his ideas about environmentally friendly forest management. And he advocates internationally for the importance of old growth forests around the world. He's the author of numerous books, including the New York Times bestseller, The Hidden Life of Trees. And he's also written The Inner Lives of Animals, The Secret Wisdom of Nature. And I'd like to thank Toadstool Bookshop of Keene, New Hampshire for hosting this event. So both Peter and Sai uh, devote their books to communicating science to general readers. And Peter, maybe you'd like to start by explaining to everyone how you began on this journey of translating science for people interested in the natural world. And then perhaps you could talk about one of the latest scientific experiments that you discuss in the heartbeat of trees. Okay, so let's start. Um, a warm welcome to everyone. Uh, listening to us and thank you very much Jane for moderating this conversation and I'm very happy Sai, to see you the first time and in person I think we have to to make an arrangement afterwards because I think our childhood was in many ways similar so um, when I was a child I think around about the age of six I already remember that I that I want to become um, a conservationist uh, at this time, of course, uh, someone who, who uh, keeps elephants in Kenya or something like, like this, but it turned out that this is not, not a real profession for a German boy. So after school, I thought about studying biology. And then I read in a newspaper article that the German Forest Commission were searching for students. And I thought, okay, the forester is someone like a tree keeper. Uh, like uh, the ends in Lord of the Rings. So, hmm, that's cool. And um, I started studying forestry and afterwards it, it turned out that the forester is a little bit more like a tree butcher. Uh, I, li I like timber beside that and, and wooden things, but um, when, when I see what forestry is doing to the, to the forest, um, then it's far away from being a tree keeper. And, uh, but I thought I could change that, and um, yeah, then then I started my journey uh, to become an environmentally friendly forester, and that means um, at first uh, to um, protect 
the old beach forests in Germany that were common ones uh, over the most parts of the country. But to come back to my childhood, um, I, we had animals or I had animals in, in my room, for example, spiders and glasses, or I had a little chicken, which I hitch on a, a heating pillow of my grandma. Because I read uh, Konrad Lorenz, um, famous research scientist who, about uh, gray geese. And I thought, okay, when I was uh, 13, I can do that myself. <laughs> I had the heating pillow, which was, which was, of course, too hot for the egg. So, so I had to uh, keep some tissue in between and with a thermometer to measure the temperature and turn the egg every somewhat hours. And so um, after many days, uh, there hatched a li little chicken and I called it Robin Hood because it, it was the, the rescue of the, of the poor. And, uh, and uh, it was really funny, but just for some days, because then it became very exhausting to care for such a little fluffy ball. And um, just to say afterwards, it was adopted by my English teacher and uh, became very, very old sitting on uh, his shoulder uh, when he was marching through the village because it, it thought it was human. And yeah, so uh, of course I was also, I was also interested in, in uh, normal things and uh, some years later in girls, of course, not just in animals, but uh, the love to nature for nature um, keeps on till today. And, and every day uh, there is a little or bigger wonder on the way, so that that's my way into the forest, out uh, out uh, in the world, and back to the forest. So into maybe the, uh, maybe Peter, you could uh, choose one of the scientific experiments that you have in the heartbeat of trees and talk a little bit uh, about it and and what you found fascinating about it and what it can tell us about trees. Um, for example, it's about um, if trees are able to feel pain. And some people think, ah, that's esoteric, um, telling about pain uh, on plants in general. And um, but um, yeah, um, I stumbled upon a New York Times interview some years ago, where a professor Frantisek Baluska, who is just one hour drive away from here at the University of Bonn, uh, was researching about um, uh, pain in plants, and uh, they they. Um, they make, made experiments with pain suppressing substances in plants and pain suppressing substances are not necessary if pain is just a reflex. For example, if pain would just be a reflex, then you can measure an electrical signal going through the tissue and there's a chemical defending reaction or whatsoever or wound healing uh, reaction. Uh, but but um, if brain um, should be something, a, a bad feeling, then um, you have to recognize it conscious. And um, the question is uh, if plants are able to do this. And um, as, um, the researchers found out that plants uh, in some situations are producing pain suppressing substances. And that's exactly what we are doing when uh, pain can become that strong that, that we are becoming un unconscious. For example, when we are heavily under stress, when we have an accident or so, then our body says no. I don't need uh, that strong pain in the moment because I need to stay conscious. And plants are doing exactly the same things. And um, they're doing it in, in some cases exactly with the same molecules. Uh, for example, in the moment, there's a research going on on uh, just one molecule for three years, uh, which is, um, which is uh, important for the signaling in our brain and also in the plant brain in the root tips, for example. So plants are not that far away from us. And yeah, there, there's strong evidence that plants are able to feel pain. Sorry for that. So um, I just like to mention that I think some of you are not on mute. And there is some background noise coming through that's a bit distracting and making it difficult to hear the speakers. So if you could just double check that you've got yourself muted, that would be fantastic. Thank you so very much. Um, so Sai, I wanted to ask you, we were chatting um, a little earlier via email and you talked about, you, you felt that there were many ways in which your view of the world and Peter's view of the world overlapped. So I wondered if you wanted to talk about that a little bit, about uh, the resonance between his work and yours. Yeah, and um, I'd like to say how cool it is that we have on screen right now, 
the major kingdoms. We've got plants with Peter, animals with me, and the toadstool can handle fungi. So this is very awesome. Anyway, um, when I read Peter's work, I think of that wonderful saying that's attributed to Thales of Miletus, which goes, the universe is alive and has fire in it and is full of gods. And what I think Thales of Miletus was saying there was that our world is so much more vibrantly alive um, that that then we then we possibly can realize it's it's more holy than we possibly can realize. My work has all been dedicated to showing that you know animals can think and feel and know. And Peter's work tells us that you know trees can warn each other of danger. They can recognize kin. They can help others in distress. They have heartbeats. They may need to sleep. And so I think Peter's work so resonates with mine in that we both are so dazzled by this world and we realize how desperately humans need to realize that all of these lives on this planet are far more complex and intelligent and emotional than anyone wants to admit. And that this demands that we treat our world with greater wonder and respect and compassion. And I think this is the way out of this mess. And that's why I write every word that I do. Every single word is essentially a, a, a plea to just, I think as I, as I said in the email, to just fall on our knees in amazement at the dazzling wonders around us and fall so deeply in love with the creatures on this earth that we find within us the, the, the wit and the courage and the smarts to heal this world that we have so wounded. So Peter, do you, do you, would you like to respond to Sai and the things that she's saying there? Yeah. Uh, um, I think I can underline every word, every single word. Um, when I remember back at, at school, um, our biology lessons were that way that, that uh, I thought, okay, nature is like a big machine. It's a big machine and the only um, species with a soul uh, are, are humans. So, um, and all other creatures are, yeah, in, in former day, uh, days would have said uh, like a machine, like a clockwork. Nowadays, we, we, we would say they are driven by their genes, like a computer, a programmed computer, which is totally wrong, which is totally wrong because that means that we are alone. And that's not true. We are surrounded by many, many creatures which are saying, become our friend. And we are saying, no, you're a machine. And I think that's, that's a very bad way to answer all those lovely beings around us. That doesn't mean that there are no hostile beings, or I wouldn't say hostile, beings which say, oh, you are a meal. <laughs> and I would say, OK. There, I have to be a little bit more careful <laughs> because uh, I, I'm more searching for friends and not not for for beings which which uh, like to transform me and, and other beings. But, uh, but in general, there, there there are no hostile beings or, or not machines. But when I was a, a schoolboy, I thought it nature should have been that way because we we were um, taught that nature is like this. And many people believe that nature is like this, and therefore. You can handle nature without care. And that's exactly what I love on you, Sai, that, that you bring so much love in, in, into science. That's exactly what science needs. And um, I know that there are some scientists um, who are saying, oh, no, that's too much uh, emotions and you're anthropomorphizing. I'm, I'm happy to, to pronounce it right because um, <laughs> I've heard it so often. <laughs> but... Uh, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm really happy that I can look at many, many animals uh, through your eyes, Sai. Boy, well, right back at you. We have both been accused of anthropomorphizing 
But goodness sakes, when you look at the data from studies that you just mentioned, showing that you know the 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 chemistry of our emotions, of our of our sensation, the way that we that we can feel the natural world, the, the ability to feel pain, um, the the capacity for sleep, um, the emotions of of fear, and all of these things can be measured. Um, in our blood and in the blood of animals, and now even in plants. And I feel far more at home in, in a world in which we really are recognizing what the DNA shows us, that we are all related. And I think when we're accused of anthropomorphism, I, I think that it's important to point out that the greater sin, the, the greater mistake, and just completely missing the whole point of everything is that the world is alive. And to think that other creatures have no thoughts or feelings or sensations is crazy. Of course we do, because we need them to survive. I mean, goodness sakes, even plants, I think, need to know when something bad's happening so they can take evasive action. And just because they can't get up and walk away, doesn't mean that it doesn't benefit them to be aware of what's going on. Same with animals. We just had a, a turtle who was hit by a hit by a car, and um, and often they can be saved, as you probably know, even when the shell is crushed. And someone came to me and said, "But turtles don't feel pain, do they?" And I'm like, "What? <laughs> of course they do." But if we believe that things don't feel pain, if we believe that, that creatures don't recognize their kin or don't care, go through the world with no awareness, that allows us to mow down all the forests and eat all the animals. So you can see where this idea comes from. But I think children are born knowing better. And that's another reason why I'm so glad you write for children as well as adults, Peter, because your kids' books, as I was saying earlier, I'm like, given them out left and right. They're fantastic, fantastic books that foster this connection that we naturally have with the natural world before the kids buy the lie that, you know, we are the only, the only species that, that matters. Yeah, and when, when it comes to the question, um, what, what is the boundary between humans and animals, the boundary between animals and plants, uh, yeah. What, what 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 is the boundary in real in uh, boundary between um, animals and plants is um, the, the thing that plants are able to produce their own food in general um, that's the main difference and you mentioned that that plants are not able to walk away exactly that's exactly the reason why they have to recognize much more things uh, going around because they can't walk away in the, in the danger. Uh, we, we are in a, in a better situation. If uh, someone dangerous is approaching, you walk away. Uh, that's the best strategy. Uh, but also many animals are, are not able to do so. Some people say, ah, the main difference between animals and plants is um, plants can't walk away. But as you know better than me, many animals are not able to walk away because they, they are fixed on its on its place like corals for example um and uh who, who wants to say that corals are not able to feel anything because when, when it comes to pain and that's why do why do we talk about pain because it's very easy to prove if, if a living being is able to feel pain but what about love i would would be happy if there are better detectors if um, so-called lower animals are able to feel love or uh, what they are talking about because we know that, that they are communicating that even slime molds singular cell organisms slime molds are communicating for example they are able to tell each other where the best way uh, to the to the oak flakes, uh, flakes are for example so uh, so there is communication even in singular cell organisms and when they communicate I don't think that they are only uh, communicating about bad things like pain, perhaps also about happiness whatsoever. And I would like to have a detector because many, many communication things are on smells or on electrical signals. And there should be one day a computer which translates smells or 
for electrical signals from plants and for animals uh, of animals into human language. And my daughter uh, once said when we were sitting in the, in the, in the, on the breakfast table, uh, at the breakfast table, um, um, if we are that intelligent, why are we always trying to teach animals human language? Why, why is this the, the other way around? For example, it would be, I would be happy if I could talk crowish like to the birds because we are befriended with the, with the crow, but, but I'm not able to do that. My intelligence is not big enough to talk in crowish, for example. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? I mean, animals yeah. are great at decoding our language. Yeah. They're terrific at it and crows will speak in English and in German, parrots will speak meaningfully as Irene Pepperberg has shown with her, her uh, African gray. Um, there've been experiments with dolphins that they've learned symbolic language and they not only understand the words, but they understand that word order, syntax matters. Dogs, you don't even have to speak. They, they know even before you know how you're feeling or if you're gonna go to the, half the time, they know when you're going to the, go to the barn before you even know you're going to the barn. They are so good at observing us. And, and I think that we've just had it um, forced out of us by society. My, my best friend, Elizabeth Marshall Thomas, whose work you probably know, she was um, with the original Marshall Expedition that lived with the, the Bushmen now called the San in Namibia in the 1950s, and subsequently wrote The Hidden Life of Dogs and a whole bunch of other wonderful, wonderful books. When she was a kid, she's, uh, uh, 80, not 80, 89. When she was a kid, she would go to the library and ask for animal books until the librarian finally said, nope, I'm not giving you any more animal books. You're gonna read books about people now. Well, man, I'd be like watching a candle burn if I couldn't read animal books. I would, I mean, golly. But I think that's where we lose our way. Would say wash that. One of the things, Peter, that you say in the heartbeat of trees and the things that you're explaining in that book is how we are equipped, how we've lost this connection with nature, but how we are equipped with senses to pick up on the natural world. So maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about how we can find our way back to nature, how we can find our way back to um listening to the messages that nature is uh, is sending us on some of those things that you talk about in in the heart beat of trees about how this thread between us and nature is just kind of gone missing but it's not broken it's still there yeah i think that this is one of the main reasons i wrote this book um, um to show that we are still very strongly connected to nature and that we are not on one side and nature's uh, on the other side of whatsoever uh, which is not true. We are still embedded. And uh, many people think, oh, we are so degenerated and it's only our intelligence uh, which keeps us alive uh, with all those artificial things uh, to, to help us uh, because otherwise we would be uh, lost in nature. And I said, no, we are still fully equipped like 10,000 years ago. Um, our eyes are perfectly, but what and many people would say, okay, eyes, okay, um, uh, but, but what about our ears? Yeah, our ears are also perfect. Our nose is perfect, for example, in smelling fruits. Uh, we can s smell fruits better than dogs because, of course, dogs are not interested in fruits or s most dogs. Uh, some dogs are also love to eat strawberries and, and uh, melon uh, and whatsoever, but <laughs> in general, we are better in this. And... Uh, um, our ears are, as I said, intact, um, our taste, um, whatsoever. So we are perfect beings also for the forest and for uh, the nature. But uh, when we are out, we are just using our eyes. And I train people, for example, by uh, trying to find out which uh, tree species it is by taste. Tasting, uh, tasting leaves, for example, of course, you have to have someone with you who is experienced with a different tree species because there are also a lot of them uh, which are poison, but uh, poisonous. But um, for example, uh, beech leaves, you can eat uh, oak, European oak uh, leaves, you can eat. And um, it's always a pleasure to see children trying to, to taste which tree species it is. And, and then they, they um, see the forest like an adventure or a playing ground and not as a, as a biology lesson room 
which is boring. And uh, yeah, I, I try to people to encourage, for example, to go at nighttime out in the forest because then you can experience your instincts. Many people say, oh no, I fear that there's, in most cases, they, they don't fear animals, they don't fear other people, bad people, uh, waiting behind a tree, <laughs> even in, in very, very lonely forests, and, um, and that are just our instincts, but it's, it's cool to experience how strong our instincts are, and that we are not driven by our intelligence, but mostly by, by instincts, and that that's why uh, how we uh, always divide animals and uh, humans. We are intelligent and animals are driven by their instincts. Hooray, welcome to the club. Uh, we are also driven by, by our uh, instincts. For example, if, you're, um, if you, you have a, a big um, plate with cake in front of you and if you uh, try to lose weight, then you can see your instincts fighting your, your intelligence and uh, your, mind, uh, your, your brain says, no, I don't want to eat this cake because I want to lose weight. And your instincts say, oh yes, eat it as fast as you can because who knows what the next day will bring. So, uh, and, and your intelligence is always, or in most cases, losing. And afterwards, uh, you're the, the only thing, and, and it's a bad loser because afterwards your intelligence says, okay, um, I, I will make it my decision and say, tomorrow I will uh, lose weight. And uh, so we are also working on instinct and that's great because one of the greatest instincts is love. <laughs> and and uh, what would we be without love, without happiness? And so we are within the club of instincts, uh, which is nothing bad. And um, in the heartbeat of trees, I try to uh, show the way back into nature. And because when we uh, know instinctively, not just by, by our brain, but, but by our hopefully green heart, uh, then we know that we have to protect nature for ourselves. Yeah, um, so first love. <laughs> so for both of you um, promoting this, uh, new way of seeing I think you know if people read your books I think they come away with a completely different perspective on the subjects that you write about <clears throat> so I wonder if each of you might like to share a, a little tip perhaps with uh, the the listeners here today about something that they could do when they step out of their front door or their back door to perceive the world around them in a slightly different way. And maybe Sai, you'd like to start off with, with some ideas maybe gathered from, from your researches across the world about what is helpful to you to ground you and see the world around you in a different way. Well, the one thing I would say for people to cultivate is patience. And this is in very short supply, not just in, watching animals or or observing plants but also when dealing with each other but it is the most useful trait that I have been able to to credit for everything I've ever seen pretty much I mean we are as Peter points out in the heartbeat of trees our senses work beautifully um, we have terrific peripheral vision and we don't even know it most of the time often you'll you'll see something and not realize it. One of the things in the book that I, I thought was amazing too was that before when we were asked in experiments to look at a flickering light, what first swiveled toward the light was not the eyeballs of the people in the experiment, but their eardrums. And that just blew me away. So uh, we have a lot going on that we don't even know. But one thing we're very bad at doing is being patient enough to sit still and wait. And in the hummingbird's gift, which is about rehabilitating these two orphan baby hummingbirds that I had a, a hand in doing with my friend, Brenda Sherburn LaBelle, um, they had a big problem at the rehab center. People would call up and say, well, I, I think this hummingbird nest has been abandoned. Should I pick it up and bring it in? And these are people who care about hummingbirds enough to make that call. But then they would be told, well, can you just watch it for half an hour and make sure that the mother really is gone? 
people won't watch a hummingbird nest for half an hour. They haven't developed the patience to do so. And so I would say number one thing would be cultivate patience and know it's going to be so well rewarded. Most of the time, even if you don't see the thing that you wanted to see, that you were patiently watching to see, I have always been rewarded by something. And sometimes the thing that you see instead of the thing that you were hoping would unfold is even more exciting, alarming, um, thrilling, uh, life-changing. And I've had that happen again and again and again. And, and Peter, if, if you were to, to tell people, uh, uh, give them some tips on experiencing the natural world, what, what, would, what would you say there? Um, before I start with my, my um, tip, I just want to say Sai is exactly that, what I did when I was a child. Uh, and I trained that just to sit patiently for an hour or two because you have to wait that, that, that something happens. And because you can't force animals to come into contact with you, uh, that, that's, I think that's um, afterwards, if, if it is so, it's much more heartwarming um, but than if you could force it, by, for example, by feeding animals. Uh, um, uh, so it's, yeah, I think that's exactly that what, what I trained when I was a child and I kept that, that, um, that be, it's exactly that minimum 30 minutes that you need, that all is calming down, that, that you're just, you, you disturb uh, this ecosystem by approaching, but when you sit down, you, be, you, you are becoming a part of this system. And then, uh, then uh, all of a sudden the life start to come back and you see, ah, and if it is just a mouse, it's okay. Uh, but in, in my um, thing I want to, want to mention is exactly um, the same, what you can do in between. When, you, when you're waiting for the thing, uh, things si, you mentioned, you can uh, make a sound map. You close your eyes and uh, hear what's going around. And um, when, you, when you have a piece of paper and a, and a pencil, write it down, which direction, which sound, and, and you will see it's a totally different world uh, around your, your place where, where you uh, are sitting. And, and when you then open your eyes, perhaps the next animal is there. <laughs> So one of the things that I'm always struck by when I when I read your books, because you are explaining science in story form for, for readers so that the, the, the facts really resonate. You don't feel like you're learning. You feel like you're experiencing things. So maybe, um, Peter, in, in the heartbeat of trees, when you were writing that, when you were doing your research with the, what the scientists were doing, uh, maybe you could talk about... Um, a particular experiment that, that really surprised you or that is changing the way uh, that we view trees today? Because I know that there's so much that's been happening very recently that is changing the way that we see trees. Yeah, for example, the heartbeat of trees, of course. Um, and uh, the research uh, that was done on, on trees by laser measurement um, was done uh, with another purpose. They, uh, the scientists wanted to find out uh, more about the sleeping behavior of trees. And we think, ah, when it becomes a sleeping behavior, oh no, that's too esoteric. But you can watch it every day in your garden when the, when the um, flowers, for example, are closing their blossoms uh, at, at, at nighttime, that is sleeping behavior. That doesn't mean necessarily that, that that flowers are dreaming of somewhat uh, that's perhaps they do, perhaps not, but sleeping behavior means that you behave different at nighttime than at the daytime. And then they were researching that and they found out that trees uh, that hang their branches around about 10 centimeters at nighttime, uh, although the water pressure in the tree is rising, so the branches should go up and not down, but they, go, they are going down for what, what reason ever. And with the sunlight, they're going up again. And um, by the way, they, they found out that the trunk is shrinking and expanding uh, in a rhythm of uh, three to four hours. Until now, nobody knows how trees bring the water from the roots to the top. There are many explanations, for example, that this is transpiration. But we all know, for example, for maple sugar, you gain the maple water before the leaves are coming out because then the water pressure is the highest in trees. It's in February or in March. And uh, then there's no green leaf out. 
that broadleaf trees. So uh, that means that the transpiration cannot be the reason uh, or uh, the answer how a tree can transport water from the roots to the tip. But this heartbeat, I love this uh, research. It's not um, uh, ended so far, the research, but uh, it, it's, yeah, it, it, it fits so perfectly because trees are so slow and many things haven't been uh, detected in the last uh, decades because we are so hastily, we are so, so uh, fast in our things. We, don't, we are unpatient, exactly, Sai. That's exactly the point. Even scientists, and they, they, are, and they, they have overlooked, uh, for example, this shrinking and expanding of trunks. And that is, is this a possible explanation that the trees have something like a heartbeat. And I love this research. So one of the things that, that strikes me is, you know, Peter's talking about um, the research that's being done into trees and the things that we do not see and we do not understand, partly because trees live life at a completely different pace from how we live our lives. So that um, exacerbates the difference between the two of us. And we see that there's a, a big divide, a big chasm and divide. But Sai, maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about um, octopus brains and how they work as an example that it's not just that there's a divide between us and plant, the plant kingdom, but there are animals that must experience our world in a completely different way from how we experience it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So the diversity is, is not just between us and animals and, you know, us and us and plants, but also within the animal kingdom, there are so many different ways of experiencing the world. Yes. And like Peter has pointed out in, in plants and trees, um, people are impatient, they don't know what they're looking for, and when you look at the octopus brain, it looks like not a brain. When you, when you look at, at the octopus's whole body, it doesn't look like anything that we're used to at all. You know, we, we go head, body, limbs, they go body, head, limbs. Most people think the octopus's head is actually its thorax with its if it's you know digestive system and its reproductive system and its its breathing apparatus, all of that is where people think the head is, but that's not where his head is. Their brain looks so not like a brain that people thought they didn't even have brains. People have made this mistake with bird brains too. They've been looking for the part of the brain that is, that we associate most with the activities that we appreciate. And they say, oh, birds don't have that. Well, they have something very comparable. So the octopus's brain is actually a ring around its neck. And whereas we have four lobes in our brain, they have, and no one really knows because everyone counts it different, but the giant Pacific has between 50 and 75 lobes in its brain. And three-fifths of its neurons are not even in its brain, but in the arms, which if severed can go off and do stuff, including hunt. So what is the octopus's experience of the world? What's its experience even of the self? Now, a lot of ways, of course, people are always applying our own metric to everything else. And so one of the ways that we test the intelligence and self-awareness of animals is the mirror test. Well, I don't know about you, but I hate looking in the mirror and I avoid it unless I'm trying to find a tick. But there's a lot of, of animals that will look in the mirror and if you put a, a red dot on their forehead, chimpanzees, for example, will touch that and realize the reflection in the mirror is them. But then scientists concluded, if you don't do that, you don't even know where your self ends and the rest of the world begins. You're so stupid, you're practically not even alive. And that just is not the case. Their experience of the world is different from ours, but no less. Octopuses might have multiple selves with all of those neurons in their arms, who knows? But one thing we do know, and I know, I know not from the science, although the science is there, the science that shows you know, that we share all the same neurotransmitters with octopuses that we do with each other. Every time they've looked for any neurotransmitter known to man, they've found it in other creatures. But 
I know a little bit of what it feels like to be an octopus because I have had friends who are octopuses. And despite, and maybe even because of our differences, there's a sameness as well. We both are curious. We both love to play. We have something to offer one another. And not only have I cared about octopuses and the other creatures that I've known, I've often been able to see for myself behaviors that showed that they had some level of caring too. And sometimes they will go to quite a bit of effort to be with me, not because I'm offering them any food or offering them shelter from something dangerous, but for the same reasons that my friends and husband want to be with me. And so I think what science needs and would benefit from recognizing is that we can use our whole selves to appreciate the natural world, not just our intelligence, not just our studies, but we can use our intuitions and we can use our own emotions too. So, so Peter, this seems a, a wonderful opportunity for you to, to talk um, about this sense of community between us and trees and this sense of community that forests have when you get tree, uh, a forest and trees uh, working together. Yeah, perhaps uh, I start with a, a more important thing, how, how trees work together. Many people think, hmm, trees being social, that's a, that's a stupid idea because they compete for light, for space, for water, for whatsoever. But it's crazy because what we know nowadays that, that, that trees, because they can't walk away, because they become that old, uh, they have to support each other. Um, forests are able to make their own local climate. And that's uh, research from uh, Germany. They found out here, researchers here that um, by satellite uh, temperature measurements that old forests are able to cool down uh, themselves around about 10 degrees Celsius in, uh, on a hot summer day. And they can create actively rain. Uh, we know more and more that we have those air rivers uh, created by forests. And uh, so that, that sounds reasonable because, yeah, of course, trees can walk away. And we, we had in the past uh, slightly climate change, not, not the big one uh, we, we, that's man-made nowadays, but trees are used to make their own climate as long as they are not disturbed by chainsaws, of course. Um, and uh, so, so they are very social, but they try to keep every single member of the forest alive because every member is a part of this big, big uh, climate club, let's say like this. And uh, they love cold weather, they love a lot of rain, they do don't love wildfires in general. There are some tree species with which, which are okay with a ground fire, but to burn, no tree likes, likes to be burned. And uh, so uh, trees can create all this and therefore, um, it's always a big advantage, but I have to commit this is a, a human view on trees because perhaps they they support each other without condition, and we we are we have problems to imagine this to support someone somewhat without condition just because it's lovely. Uh, it's our interpretation to say okay they they benefit from this of course and they do. But that may not be the only or most important reason, because we know, um, as you said, Jane and Sai, they, they care for their offspring. Um, they, they care for weakened uh, members of, of the society. And uh, so they, they are not fighting each, each other. Um, and so a force is, is much more peacefully than many scientists thought for, for decades. And we can still be part of this. I, I'm not sure if trees care about us, but uh, they, they tolerate us as long as we don't dis disturb this wonderful system and we can benefit from it. Um, and we just have to let, uh, to, uh, to let return those forests and they return much faster uh, than we think if we don't think we can create forests, but because those artificial forests, they are always weakened. Because, uh, there are many reasons and I think the time is too short to explain this, but Natural forests, forests which come back uh, on their own, 
they're as strong as they are since 300 million years and that are the good news. So um, thank you. Thank you both. We have um, about 10 minutes now for, for questions from people. Um, and uh, we do have um, a question here from uh, Joanne and she is asking specifically Peter <clears throat> about um, how trees relate to one another through their root system. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about the, uh, the other helpers that uh, trees have to help facilitate the communication uh, in the forest and, and help make forests strong. And this is just an aside for me. And then what the problem is if you clear cut a forest and what happens to all of those interrelationships. Yeah, uh, we, we know since the 1970s that trees, for example, are communicating, uh, that they warn each other. In this case, it was first um, discovered in Africa on acacia trees that they warn each other when giraffes are browsing on them. Uh, when, we, when I became a young forester, we were told that the trees share uh, nutrition, that they share sugar because at this time, trees were poisoned with Agent Orange, um, even in Germany, to get rid of broadleaf tree uh, forest and to, to uh, replace them with uh, conifer plantations. So uh, that was where my face first touched uh, when I became first uh, in touch with those uh, communication things. And uh, meanwhile, we know uh, that trees uh, uh, form big networks of um, uh, 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 in which they are um, supporting each other with uh, sugar solution, but also with the news, with the warnings. And um, on the other hand, that they are, as I said, um, producing uh, their own climate. So it's, it's a whole social communi community with lots of communications, uh, with uh, lots of support. And if you cut a forest, um, when, when trees are dying, that's not the problem. And even if they die because of bark beetles, but when you clear cut a forest, then for example, the fungi network uh, will be destroyed. And fu fungi can become as old as thousands of years. They, they are on the same slow side of the life like um, trees. So um, if you destroy a forest by a clear cut, you will destroy um, the home of more than 100,000 species, many, many of them very, very small, like bacteria, for example. Uh, we know, for example, that trees have the bigger part of the human system outside the roots uh, made of bacteria. If you destroy a forest, all those bacteria life will die because uh, it depends on sugar solution from the roots. Uh, and if you afterwards replace this forest by a new plantation, then uh, you have just trees, but no ecosystem. And then many people wonder why such a forest won't grow very healthy or why the, the freshly planted trees will die very shortly in, in, hot, in hot temperatures. For example, the surface temperature um, on a clear cut is more in, on hot summer days, more than, than 60 degrees Celsius. And that means you can boil eggs. <laughs> <laughs> How should trees grow? Whereas uh, old mother trees uh, uh, would have cooled down uh, this forest so that the young trees can can start in a cool, cool uh, local climate. And this is all very long known. For example, the um, expression of the term mother tree um, is uh, already can already be found in a book of the Brothers Grimm, the fairy tale writers uh, from the 19th century. Alexander Humboldt uh, already know, uh, knew around about the year 1840 that the trees are very important for the local rain and for low temperatures. So that's all very long known to, to uh, science and to people. And we have to discover this once more, but we have to speed a little bit up to, to transform this into action. So, um, Sai, is there anything that you would like to say about this interconnectedness of life and this importance of community, a community that we are a part of? Well, I think right now, so many of us are coming out of a period in which we feel battered and vulnerable and helpless. I think our connection with not just one another, our fellow humans, which we're now reaching out and enjoying, 
but our connection with the rest of the larger world. I think this is the resurrection that we can be part of. And um, this can make us all whole again. And until, until we recognize that we're all family and until we, we try to put this world back together, we're gonna still feel fragmented. So I think the way back is with our hearts, reestablishing the bonds that we already share right down to our DNA with everybody, with the octopuses and the hummingbirds and the trees and the, and the fungi. And um, then we'll be part of the world again. So I would like to say that I think that that's one of those things that, uh, and I see that someone has got their hand up and I will get to you, Lydia, in just a moment. But um, I think it's one of the things that uh, Peter does so well in Heart Boot is reminding us that we were part of uh, this larger community of nature and some very specific um, examples of how we interact with it, how we're still capable of interacting with it, and what we're learning about that natural world. We got a couple of questions. We got about... Um, five to eight minutes left. We got a couple of questions in the chat box, but I'm just going to ask Lydia if she has a quick question, if she wants to unmute herself and ask the question. Hello all. Hello, my good friend, Sai. I have just recently returned from a trip to the national parks in Utah and Colorado. And at Zion, our tour leader had scratched a small spot on a tree as we were coming down through the canyon and asked us what it smelled like. Well, it smelled like butterscotch. And I don't remember him ever telling us what tree kind of a tree that was. What do you think, Peter? <laughs> I'm not an expert in <laughs> trees in Utah, a but I think Jane, you mentioned that tree, right? Uh, or, or email correspondence. It, it well, was an evergreen of some kind. Well, I certainly know that uh, Ponderosa pines and Jeffrey pines have a very distinct kind of vanilla smell. And I think that one of the things that Peter talks about too is how you can smell trees differently depending on whether it's hot or whether the weather yeah. is cold. And you can get so much information about forests through our senses in ways that we would not um, usually uh, expect. So um, we have a quest We have another question here. Oh, sorry, I'm having difficulty re releasing these. Um, this, these questions are more uh, about communication. We've got about five minutes uh, left uh, about uh, communication with, is there any communication between birds and trees that you know of, Peter? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, I think so because uh, birds are, as I said, very intelligent that are flying dinosaurs, right? They are not extinct. Uh, and uh, um, because uh, trees are communicating. For example, if trees um, um, have a stress communication, then some insects can smell that and say, okay, I'm going, going to attack you. And if insects attack trees, then woodpeckers say, oh, wow, there are insects attacking trees. That, that's our prey. So I, I, I think I don't know uh, a study right in the moment that says, okay, there is a direct communication. But we know, for example, that trees are calling insects for help. The predators, for example, from certain caterpillars. Therefore, why shouldn't trees call uh, birds for help? We know, for example, that uh, I think it's, it's, I don't know the, the, the English name, but a certain plant, uh, I think it's also common in Canada, uh, imitates uh, human sweat smell to attract mosquitoes. So right. Oh, I yeah. just heard that. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's yeah. yeah. If plants are able to do that, uh, I think trees are able to call birds. Uh, but uh, but I don't know a studies uh, research so far, but I'm, I'm sure that there should be some communication. Oh, that's just... 
Oh, I'm sorry. Well, when Go they ahead, send Cy. out red flowers, they're certainly calling hummingbirds. I mean, the flowers are calling and they're calling to bats also. Um, and uh, and they, they call with their scent. They call with invisible light, invisible to us. A lot of uh, flowers have um, it guides that will help the pollinators. It's almost like a landing strip on an air, on an air strip. They'll have these invisible guides showing like, oh, nectar is right here. And uh, we can't see it, but you can see it in polarized light, which bees and birds and some other insects can see. So, so I mean, that's almost like a big poster. <laughs> it's definitely communication that's going on between the plants manipulating or communicating with the animals that they wish to um, come and help pollinate them. And so there's a reciprocal relationship going on between them. Now we have two minutes very quickly, Peter. P people are asking if there be, can be a communication between people and trees in a way that the trees will respond. Um, very, very quickly, what do you have to say uh, about that? Um, that's not a research so far, but uh, uh, people respond to tree communication. I think that's for the moment, that's more than enough. Uh, we know that our blood pressure is, sink think, is sinking, that we are um, reacting on tree communication because we can instinctively judge if a forest is intact, that means a good place to live, or if a forest is instable because the, the system is not working, the trees are under stress. And we would say, uh, conscious, hmm, it's not so nice here. Let's let's change uh, let's change um, the place. So uh, there is a reaction, and that is perhaps the first step to realize that that we are part of tree communication, although we are not able, as long as I know, uh, to answer. Well, thank you very much. So that brings us just about around to the hour. It's been absolutely fascinating. I'd like to thank you all so much for coming. And I'd like to thank especially Peter and for, to Sai for the great conversation that we've had today. And thank you very much, Toadstool Books. Remember, those books are available for you to purchase from Toadstool Books. And they have host, done a great job hosting this event for us, too. Thank you very much, Jane. Thank you very much, Sai. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, thank you to Toaster Bookshop and thank you to you all that you have taken one hour to listen to us. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody. Very much. Bye -bye. Thank you.